wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged podcast, episode 125, weight loss and sleep. Nice, skinny, roller skate skinny. Welcome everyone to the podcast. My name is Chris Winter. I'm a neurologist, sleep specialist, and your host for this episode of the podcast. If you're new to the Sleep Unplugged podcast family, welcome. If you're a veteran, welcome back. We're happy to have you here. If you want to get in touch with the show, you can find me online, social media, Twitter, social media, Instagram is Dr. Chris Winner. Please like and subscribe to the show. We really appreciate all your reviews and positive comments. We have a YouTube page where we put all the videos of this podcast. And one of the listeners keenly pointed out that we had accidentally posted on the YouTube page the mouth taping video was not the mouth taping video. So if you go to the YouTube for the mouth taping episode, it was a completely different episode. And I don't think that I have that video anymore. So the YouTube page has all the episodes, all 125 of them, including tonight, except for mouth taping. So if you want mouth taping, you just have to listen to it. You cannot see it. And if you're a connoisseur of the podcast, you know that the Catathrini episode on YouTube is wildly popular. It just went over 10,000 likes. I have no idea why. So uh, comments, corrections, criticisms. I think what I'll do instead of that are two. The first is somebody asked, uh, because they followed me on, on Instagram, how's your progress towards benching 300 pounds. So if you follow me on uh, Instagram, every now and then I post this mission that I've been on for well over a couple of years now to bench press 300 pounds. And, and that came about because in high, I used to tell people in high school, I think I bench pressed 305 pounds. The older I got, the more I doubted the validity of that statement. So to just make everything super clear, I was just going to make it a mission to bench press 300 pounds, 300 pounds, got to 290 and have massively regressed since that time. So not well, but I'll let you all know if I ever hit it. I'm, I'm beginning to doubt my capabilities at this point. Um, the real comments that I wanted to highlight for this podcast were based upon last week's episode on grief and sleep. I got so many kind messages through email and social media, just, you know, sorry you're a lot about your loss and hang in there. And just, it's just cool to be a part of this community. And it's unfortunate that it takes an act of death to sort of bring that out. But I, I really appreciate everybody's concerns. Uh, moving forward, just an announcement. We have been sort of sponsor and ad free up into this point, 125 episodes. We are now selling one ad per episode. And I've denied this over and over since the episode since the podcast started, but we've actually gotten some people interested in purchasing ads that have products that we've mentioned on the on the podcast or that I believe in. So there will be episodes going forward that will have one, one ad, uh, a singular ad, and um, I will make sure that we keep the front of the show brief uh, to compensate for the 60 second spot. So just wanted to make you aware of, of that small change. We always feature a lyric of a song in the title of the show. And there were several Smiths and Morrissey songs that I was thinking about for this one that uh, were probably not, uh, they're probably a little tone deaf, but but songs that I do like. Um, and I went with Roller Skate Skinny, which is a song by the old 97s. Now, the line in the song is, you're pretty as a penny, Roller Skate Skinny. And I've always liked this album. It was, and Rhett Miller is the lead singer of the old 97s. They're a great, fun, kind of indie, alt-country band that have got some of the best writing of any songs ever. It was tuned into this by a medical school buddy. And their fifth album was called Satellite Rides. They had a big song, uh, Question, 
which I think was on Scrubs. It's it's on sort of this the song that every show, movie plays before the protagonist asks the other person to marry them. And I never knew what it was re referenced to. And, and later in life, I read Catcher in the Rye. I, I started reading books that I feel like I should have read by this age, but haven't. And Catcher in the Rye was one of them. And in it, the main protagonist of the book, Holden Caulfield, describes his sister as nice skinny, you know, roller skate skinny. And so the line from the title of this podcast is not technically the line from the song, but I thought nice skinny roller skate skinny made a little bit more sense, but I really just want to put an old 97s on the Spotify music playlist. So Spotify music playlist volume three will now feature roller skate skinny. And actually roller skate skinny was written by Rhett Miller about Winona Ryder who he dated briefly. So there's your little trivia nugget for Old 97's Roller Skate Skinny. Listen to the album. Buick City Complex is one of my favorites on there. And uh, Question is, is just a classic. So moving on with the podcast, I, I, I was surprised that I had not done this episode when I was kind of looking through. And I'm getting to the point now with the podcast where if somebody says something about weight loss or it comes up in my clinic, I'm like, oh, you should listen to the weight loss episode of the podcast. And that came up recently. And I was like, oh, wait, we don't really have a weight or weight loss podcast episode related to sleep. And it came up in another way in my clinic when a patient said, hey, listen, I've got a really strong connection with you. I don't really have that kind of connection with my PCP. And I really want to try one of the weight loss medications, the new weight loss medications that everybody's on. And he said, would you prescribe it for me? And initially I said, no, but I, I sort of compromised with him and said, well, listen, I will call my good buddy, Bill Fox, that we've mentioned on the podcast before, who's my primary care doctor and a real medicine guru and I'll ask him his honest opinion about what he thinks a sleep specialist should be doing with weight loss medications. And if he says it's okay, then I'll consider it. If he says, Chris, this is really beyond your pay grade, um, then we'll figure out alternative uh, means for, for what you should do. Called up Bill Fox and Bill said, oh, by all means, you should be writing these medications. They are going to transform the face of medicine. They're pretty safe. Here are some things to look out for, thyroid and pancreatitis, et cetera. And, uh, you know, they're expensive. And what he told me was, you know, patients are going to be on them most likely the rest of their life, which is really interesting to me. So long story short, we went back, went back to this patient said, look, if you're game, I'm game, but, you know, we just want to check in with each other and make sure everything's going okay put him on the medication. He is now, I think my only patient on the weight loss medication and he's doing well and losing weight and very happy with it. Has had no issues uh, to date. So it's interesting when I go around lecturing about sleep and I don't think that I've been anywhere in the last week. I do talk to a lot of physicians and something that I noticed many, many years ago was the sleep doc, weight loss doc combo, which to me, it made sense, but not nearly as much sense as it makes to me, makes, uh, to me at this point in my career. I see a lot of patients and organizing their sleep is sort of a natural first step in the weight loss journey. So I love the fact that these providers are out there, I met a couple in Chicago, that combine weight loss and sleep. I think they're two fantastic things to sort of put together. So I wanted in this podcast to explore that a little bit and look at some of these relationships. If you are a veteran listener of the podcast, you know that we always seem to explore a relationship, A causing B, but wow, could B cause A. And I think there's a little bit of that going on here with sleep in the sense that 
Let's talk about the lion's share of a sleep clinic, which is sleep apnea. Can weight loss influence sleep apnea? And I think everybody thinks that the answer is, is yes. And, and I, I believe it is. And, and what I'm saying here is that if you have been diagnosed with sleep apnea, can changing your weight influence the severity or even the presence of sleep apnea? And I think we can say pretty confidently that the answer to that question is yes. There was a 2022 study in JAMA entitled Effective and Interdisciplinary Weight Loss and Lifestyle Intervention on Obstructive Sleep Apnea Severity. The inter, I-N-T-E-R, apnea, the interapnea randomized clinical trial. This was an interdisciplinary weight loss and lifestyle intervention that involved Spanish men with moderate to severe sleep apnea. So there's somewhere in that a 20 to 35 range or slightly higher, overweight, obese, receiving CPAP therapy, and looking at how that lifestyle change influenced their sleep apnea. So there were 89 men, an average age was 54, 49 were ra randomized to the control group, 40 randomized to the intervention group. The intervention group had a greater decrease in AHI, which is a 51% reduction. Uh, they The reduction involved about 21 events per hour. So if we're talking about somebody with severe sleep apnea, let's call it 35 events per hour, um, they're down to what, 13 events per hour, which it puts them in sort of the, you know, the mild category of sleep apnea. Certainly if they have more moderate sleep apnea, a uh, 21 event decline could mean that they no longer have sleep apnea anymore. So when they looked at the intervention group, 18 of the 40 participants, 45% no longer required CPAP therapy at the intervention endpoint. And six of the 40 participants attained complete obstructive sleep apnea syndrome remission. At six months after intervention, 21 of the 34 participants, that was about 62%, no longer required CPAP therapy and complete remission was attained by 10 of the 34 participants, which was almost 30%. So if we're talking about sort of normal levels of sleep apnea, moderate to sort of low severe, I think weight loss can play a huge role in sleep apnea therapy and whether or not they actually need sleep, ap uh, sleep, sleep apnea therapy. And we see this. I don't see it as much as I would think that I would see it. The idea that somebody's got sleep apnea, they're overweight, they treat their sleep apnea, you know, lose weight, and they eventually get off the CPAP. It's not nearly as common as one might think it would be, but it does happen. In fact, I've had several patients who I felt maybe had reached that point, but they wanted to continue to wear the CPAP. That's not uncommon either. I've even had patients who have had repeat studies. And when the study shows that they don't have sleep apnea and they stop the CPAP, they're coming back saying, I don't sleep nearly as well off the CPAP. I want back on it, which can be kind of a task when it comes to an insurance company when you've basically said, look, they don't have sleep apnea anymore, and now you want to CPAP back. So there's a lot of really interesting sort of subgroups that come from these populations. So the other one that I always believed, and I'll be honest with you, I still kind of do a little bit, but I believe it less and less now is sort of the opposite. So that was, does weight loss influence sleep apnea and CPAP use? The flip is you've been diagnosed with sleep apnea, does using a CPAP or treating your sleep apnea influence weight loss? And there was a 2008 journal of clinical, it was in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine that looked at 309 subjects. Um, I think most were, 64% were men. And they were basically um, had used CPAP, they were using CPAP therapy prior to visit there was no statistically significant difference in age or initial BMI between the treatment group or the control subjects who were not using a CPAP. So in that study, 
the use of the CPAP to treat the sleep apnea did not seem to influence body mass index. Uh, in 2019, a small study of 119 people found that more than half of participants experienced weight loss very shortly after starting CPAP and only a small percentage, 6% experienced weight gain. However, two years later in a 2021 meta-analysis on, meta, meta on sleep apnea, found that CPAP treatment resulted in significant weight gain. Like the 2013 clinical trial, it found longer CPAP usage was linked to higher weight increases. So overall, the majority of lar large-scale, high-quality research indicates that CPAP is actually more likely to cause you to gain weight than lose weight. And I don't know that I see that, but again, I have to look at recall bias in myself. Maybe I don't think about the people gaining weight or I'm strangely focused on the people losing weight. Also, I think that the population of individuals I serve in Charlottesville, Virginia could potentially maybe not reflect the greater population as a whole. We do talk about weight and weight loss in our clinics. And certainly I I do see a lot of individuals who continue to gain weight despite being on the CPAP. So I tend to believe these numbers and wonder if 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 I skew these things in, in my own mind. But I like to believe that treating sleep apnea influences weight in a positive way. And I think studies have shown that using a CPAP can be part of a weight loss strategy. But I'll bet you, if we had guests on the show and I had some of my sleep apnea uh, friends on here, they would say, Chris, if you're just prescribing CPAP and just hoping that your patients are going to lose weight, sure, they'll lose a little initially. But over the long haul, if you're not stepping in to intervene and really solidify that long-term weight loss, you're probably missing the boat, which is my guess in terms of what they would probably say. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about insomnia and weight loss and weight gain. Now, I think it's pretty clear that sleep deprivation tends to lead to increased weight. And so it becomes a problem when you start searching for literature about true insomnia, you also get a lot of information about sleep deprivation. And as you know from the show, these two terms are not synonymous. Uh, when you actually look for insomnia and weight, it's pretty complicated. And it seems to show different things in different populations. So there have been a lot of studies that have shown short sleep duration does influence weight in terms of causing weight gain and obesity. And that poor sleep quality, all comers, tends to be associated with weight gain and, and um, obesity. So there was this prospective study of 812 subjects who were free of metabolic syndrome at baseline. And they were looking at their insomnia, which did not seem to predict the development of that metabolic syndrome and weight gain over the next three years. Um, and that severe insomnia patients actually sometimes exhibit a lower BMI when you look at them compared to the rest of the population. And this was shown um, uh, in several studies. There were some other studies, including one military study that showed slightly higher BMI in individuals who had comorbid sleep disorders. And this was, I think, like 100 military personnel. So insomnia can sort of play both sides of the, of the table here. And one of the studies that I, I want to highlight that I thought was really interesting was a study entitled Insomnia with Physiological Hyperarousal is Associated with Lower Weight, a Novel Finding and Its Clinical Implications. So basically in this study, they were trying to sort out insomnia and insomnia with hyperarousal. So they looked at 185 normal sleepers and 445 patients with insomnia. Everybody had to have insomnia lasting more than six months. So they divided the insomnia group based upon arousal. And they did this 
in sort of a novel way, which was using the MSLT that we typically use for evaluations of hypersomnia, not necessarily hyperarousal in individuals. So it, the MSLT is not a study that jumps to mind when you're thinking about the insomnia patient. Yeah, you know, we often do overnight sleep studies and we get a lot of information from that, but hanging on to insomnia patients the next day after the sleep study to see how quickly they fall asleep on average in the five, four or five nap opportunities is not something that is commonly done. And so what they found was that the BMI was based on, you know, their baseline characteristics and that the odds of lower weight rather than overweight were significantly increased among insomnia patients with increased MSLT insomnia. So if you scored on the MSLT 14 through 17 or greater than 17, um, there was an increased risk of lower weight. So they were calling these individuals insomnia with physiologic with hyperarousal, meaning that they have insomnia, they sleep poorly, but the next day when you give them opportunities to fall asleep, they're not taking you up on it. In fact, in fact, the, the, the MSLT, the average time it's taking them to fall asleep is very high. When you look at the individuals with insomnia that did not display that hyperarousal, those individuals, um, had a much more, were much more likely to have the increased weight. Um, so it's an interesting, there's a lot of, when I read through that study, there were problems with it. Um, it didn't do a great job of sort of, you know, creating sort of the expectation of what that polysomnogram prior to the MSLT would look like. So could you actually be grabbing hypersomnia patients in there? Um, as well that are you know scoring very low on the MSLT or is that true sleep deprivation? So anyway, so it is worth thinking about our insomnia population as potentially being at risk for being both over and underweight as we look at them. So what do we do in the future? I think to me, it is very simple. If you are struggling with your sleep, there are chemical processes going on in your brain the increase uh, in ghrelin that's making you crave carbohydrates and all the junk food you find in a gas station convenience store, the suppression of leptin, which is a chemical uh, made by your adipose cells that makes you feel full. All of these things are summing to make you eat. It's like the sleep deprivation or the sleep problem, the sleep uh, the scheduling of your sleep being all over the place, like a shift worker, the inadequate sleep, the dysfunctional sleep, Anything that's ruining the nature of your sleep is going to lead you to want to eat more and most likely gain weight. So to me, if you're somebody who struggles with your weight, show yourself a little grace. And I would say, put the weight situation on the back burner and find somebody to ally with you in terms of helping you sort out your sleep in a positive way. And maybe that same individual, once you get your sleep sorted out, can help you begin your weight loss journey in a scientifically academic forward way. Um, and at this point, if you are in my clinic, you're definitely getting part A. I am slowly coming around to part B, mainly because I think there are people that could handle part B better than I could. But you know, it's never never too late, too late for the old sleep doctor to learn some new tricks and science is making that a whole lot easier. So I'm curious about your own weight loss journeys, what things worked for you, what things didn't. We'll talk about those in the comments, corrections, criticisms of upcoming uh, podcasts. So next week, we're going to talk about sleep and air travel since a lot of people are going to be visiting uh, friends and loved ones uh, during this time of the holidays. And then next week will be our third annual Black Friday sleep gift giving guide. We'll talk about all the latest and greatest uh, stuff out there that you can give somebody uh, for the holidays who need something to help them sleep better. And given 
what we've gone through this week, my guess is there are a lot of people struggling with their sleep right now. The Sleep Unplugged podcast has you covered. So that's it. Sleep and weight done and dusted. If you want to get in touch with the show, it's Dr. Chris Winter Twitter, Dr. Chris Winter Instagram. Find our YouTube page. Please like and subscribe to the podcast. Maeve will be doing her sleep for yoga. Or I'm sorry, her yoga for sleep class, 7.45 to 9 p.m. It is virtual. It is through Integral Yoga Institute, New York. I gave the wrong website address last week. It's iyiny.org. Check out virtual classes. Look for Maeve's class. It begins at 7.45. I will see you all there because I am stiff and needing it. So until next week, sleep well.